Hello again and welcome to Emotion Regulation 5. Okay, so we have already learned so much, haven't we, which has just been brilliant. And I, this session is going to be slightly more interactive. So I want you to have pen and paper to hand, hand out some worksheets at the ready. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through our plan, which is to look at um, mindfulness exercise, a teeny tiny recap, uh, emotion regulation, five skills, and look at the homework practice tasks for this week. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do, as usual, is our mindfulness exercise. So just to sort of allow yourself to get comfortable but alert as wherever you are and um, but just before we start just to sort of check in with yourself about where you are are there any distractions around is there anything in the environment do you need to clear a space somewhere if you were to scan yourself from the top of your head down to the tips of your toes what might you just notice are there any adjustments you need to make And with our mindfulness exercises, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to focus on how we bring our mind back. Because we know that when we do a mindfulness task or usually any sort of everyday task, there are things that interrupt that um, uh, without us being aware of it sometimes. There are things that, being, that interrupt that, that, that get in the way of us doing the, the task that we want to um, be involved in and so what we're wanting you to do is when to notice when those are occurring so it might be that you notice yourself sitting here now and you're you're wondering about what mindfulness exercise we're going to be doing and wondering about that does that make it easier or harder to do the mindfulness task are you creating an assumption in your mind um, are you particularly attached to a mindfulness exercise that we've done and you're sort of secretly hoping we'll be doing that one? So it's not just about looking at what happens um, during the mindfulness exercise. It's also about looking at what happens just before then and how that affects our, our abilities to do the things we want to do. And then, as always, it's really useful to sort of ask ask ourselves a question you know does that make sense that i would have those sort of types of thoughts coming in is that something that mirrors my everyday life and if it is increasing our awareness of that means that we are more able to do things that um, help challenge that or help regulate our emotions so that we're more able to deal with them So I'm quite excited about this, actually. Um, we are going to be doing a mindful movements um, uh, exercise. Now, I'm going to give you the choice here of what you do. OK. But what we want to do throughout this exercise is to observe our bodies. And what we're observing is it's becoming more connected with how our bodies feel. Um, observing ourselves when we move our bodies and observing what happens when we we slow our movements down and when we pay more attention to our movements. And throughout this exercise, because you're going to have the choice about what you want to do, you might need to just decide now what you're going to use to bring yourself back. So it might be that um, you, you're going to be leaning on something and it might mean that you, you focus on your hands touching, say, the back of a chair. It might be that you bring yourself back by focusing on the slide. Or I'm also going to be doing some movements. I am absolutely not going to be doing the movement over it's just like that over on over here on the left hand side on video 
but I am going to be doing this movement so you could focus your mind by bringing yourself back to watching me doing this this movement so i'm just going to run through this first okay some of you are going to have some limitations with movement so for those of you who have any um, difficulties with any part of your body you need to adapt this to what's going to suit you okay i'm going to stand and move my chair back a bit so that you can see me okay so Okay, so I don't know if you can see, but this is my chair. So I'm going to have my, my hands on the back of the chair. And I'm going to have my hands on the back of my chair and just to allow myself to steady myself. So one option is to stand with your hands resting on something and to just allow your body to move in whatever way you want to do that. And you might be moving from side to side, you might be lifting a leg up or down you might be moving backwards or forwards you may decide at some point to just move your arms out it doesn't really matter what you're doing you're just following what your body feels like doing at that moment for those of you who prefer to have a bit more of a structure then i'm going to be doing a series of exercises so the first one is the one right in the middle of the slide and what we're going to do is we're going to open our arms up and then we're going to inhale to bring our arms touching our shoulders and then we're going to exhale bringing our arms back out again and the idea with these movements is that they're very slow and you're just observing your body and your breath now usually they advise doing say three of these and then changing it to something else but as you're going to find quite quickly, your arms might feel a bit tired. So then when I've done three of those, I'm going to move on, put my hands on my back of my chair, I'm going to rotate my legs, small circles, very slow circles, doing one at a time. Okay. So we're going to do this mindfulness exercise um, for three minutes. So I want you to just get yourself in position now and then wait for me to ring the, the bell. Okay.
Okay. What did you notice? Just take a few moments to just pause and go through the process in your mind and to jot down what you noticed, what intruded, what made it easier or harder to do the exercise, are there any judgments you made? Did you make up some rules? Did you feel you needed to follow me? Were there times when I did more movements than um, you were expecting? Was there a judgment there? Let's spend a few moments just jotting that down. So our teeny tiny recap. The last two, two ear emotion regulation sessions have been looking at check the facts, opposite action and problem solving. So there's a lot in those two slides and there's a lot of unbelievably invaluable um, tips and strategies on how to um, regulate emotion. So how did you get on? How did you get on with your homework? What did you learn? Allow yourself to pause for a moment and think about what did I learn from those slides? Is there any way I could nip back and have a look at those? How often did you check the facts and use opposite action and problem solving? And purely out of my curiosity, because we were doing a lot on posture last, last session and, and actually the other two sessions before that about how our posture affects our emotions. How often did you check your posture? How often did you just check in with yourself and seeing if you needed to adjust anything? What did you notice? So without further ado, I'm going to introduce this week's emotion regulation skills, which are all about reducing vulnerability to emotion mind. And this is massively important because I think for me it comes under the heading of let's not make this harder than it needs to be. Dealing with emotions is, is tough and there's lots we can do about that and it's a lot easier if we have reduced our level of vulnerability to being in emotion mind and we have found ways where we can access wise mind much more quickly. So there are things that we can do that reduce that vulnerability but there are also things that we can do that make us much more resilient there are things that we can do that build on skills that mean that we reduce that vulnerability. So, because this is going to be a bit more of an interactive session, you need to have some of the handouts and worksheets available to you from the emotion regulation um, pack that we sent you. So in particular, you need to have handouts 14 to 20 to hand. Okay, so. Just pause this video, go and get them now if you haven't already. Hi, so please skills. Well, I could do an entire lecture on please skills because they are so incredibly crucial. And I really love this quote, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. That's so true. And it's not rocket science, is it? We know an awful lot of these things. If you build a house on really shaky foundations, the house is not going to stand up for very long. If you play a game of Jenga, now that lovely tower of blocks, and you pull out the ones from the bottom, it's going to be a really quick game. Because basically, when we mess with our foundations in any way, we topple very quickly. It increases our vulnerability. That's why trees are felled at the bottom. They fall quicker. So something else gets in the way, doesn't it? Because this is all makes an awful lot of sense, but sometimes we're not very good at doing it. Or maybe you are. Maybe you're looking through that list and feeling really pleased with yourself right now. 
I'm about on you. If you're not doing some of these things or all of these things, what's getting in the way? Allow yourself just to pause for a moment and just jot down the things that come into your head when you focus on this slide and you focus about doing some of the things that you know are really good for you. What are the unhelpful thoughts that come in the way? I know for myself, um, there's definitely a, oh, I'll do it tomorrow or it'll be fine. So given the choice between sitting on the sofa and going for a nice long walk, Quite frankly, my urge is to sit on the sofa more or less every time. So I need to work really hard with opposite action because sitting in the, on the sofa long term is really not good for my mental health or my body. So that means we need to use pros and cons a lot as well. And there may be also other things that are getting in the way. So for instance, if we are minimising physical illness, not only do we not do we need to use opposite action, but we also perhaps need to look at our interpersonal skills as well. Maybe going and seeking help is something you find difficult. There are skills that can help with that. When we look at eating, it makes sense, doesn't it, that it's fuel for our bodies, that what we put in matters. For those of you who have a car, if you have a petrol car and you don't put any petrol in it, it doesn't function very well. In fact, it just doesn't go. However, there are other things that affect it. So if we run it on empty, or nearly empty most of the time, it doesn't do our engine any good. If we, instead of putting petrol in it, we put diesel in it, that pretty much grinds up everything eventually. It does a lot of damage to our engines. So food is a fuel, and what we put in our bodies affects both our, our body and our brain affects the chemicals in our brain. There's a lot on the news about sugar addiction and what that does. This is a very real thing. So if we want our minds to function well, we need to pay attention to the food that we put in our bodies. It goes without saying, doesn't it, that mood altering substances do exactly what they say on the tin. They alter our mood and that is not good. So we can distort or minimize the, the, um, the facts as much as we like, but actually the facts are these do affect our mood. And if we are vulnerable, they are going to affect our mood more in our mental health. Sleep is crucial, isn't it? There is a reason why sleep is used as a method of torture. It makes us very disorientated and confused, difficulty with concentrating when we don't have enough sleep. And there are other factors around sleep which are really important to pay attention to. So, for instance, the temperature that we go to sleep at, whether we're looking at screens before we go to sleep, that blue light affects our ability to go to sleep. If we have a television in our bedrooms, that also affects our ability to get off to sleep. And there's other facts as well, so I'm just going to turn over the page. When we stay awake, when we don't go to sleep, being awake for 19 hours is cognitively damaging as, as much as being legally drunk. Also affects our ability to lose weight. If we are sleeping less than eight hours a, a, a night, we, we start craving um, fats and sugars, which are not good for our bodies and make us put on weight. Sleep has also been shown to affect athletic performance and sleep affects, lack of sleep affects our immune system. There's an interesting studies around alarms. When we set our alarms, that causes a stress response. This is really important because actually if you do that alarm and then snooze, you're setting off multiple um, stress responses. So what we want to do is we want to get into a sleep habit that allows us to wake up naturally at a time that, we, that is good for us. And that means going to bed early enough and getting a good night's sleep. Now, handout 20, 20B looks at sleep hygiene. Have a look at it. See if you're doing all the things on the list. See if there's any way you can improve and get a better night's sleep. 
and the next slide is going to focus on exercise. OK, I'm pretty sure that you know all this. OK, but just in case you don't, exercising regularly helps mental clarity. We think better, basically. We have a better sleep, better mood, improved skin, always good. Helps us lose weight if we need to. We have stronger bones that helps protect us in old age, lower blood pressure, stronger immune function, lower heart rate, muscle strengthening and definition of muscles. So we look better too. Basically, I think you know yourself that if you're exercising, you become more aware of your body, you're more alert, you hold yourself better, it just releases a lot of really good stuff. And the brain benefits massively from exercise because what it's doing is it's stimulating the production of neurochemicals that promote brain cell repair. It improves our memories, lengthens how long we can attend to things, how long our attention span is. It allows us, because we are concentrating more, we are tending more to make more decisions quickly and with wise mind. And it prompts the growth of a few of new nerve cells and blood vessels. It makes it makes us healthy. It improves multitasking and planning abilities. So all of these things are hugely important for our mental health. By addressing these building blocks, what we do is we give ourselves a massive advantage in being able to come away from emotion mind and access wise mind. So we're now on to looking at accumulating positive emotions. So the A part of the ABC. This is really so, so important and is, is a, one of the most pleasurable things to be doing um, with, the, with the DBT skills. Because basically what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to build our resilience with this. So the more positive events that we can include in our daily life, um, the more resilience we build and the more we reduce our vulnerability to um, painful emotions. So this is a way of building our life in the long term, which makes us less sensitive to those painful emotions that often feel quite overwhelming. OK, so first of all, what I want you to do is I want you to get hold of handout number 16. And then what I want you to do is I want you to pause this video. And when you pause this video, you need to complete handout 16. So complete the pleasant events list. So what I want you to do is, is to tick off all the ones that feel like they appeal to you in some way. And that's going to be different on different days, depending on your mood. So don't discount the ones that you haven't ticked. Go back over them at a different time. See if there's any more you could include. So you're going to pause the video and you're going to complete the pleasant events list. OK, so then what we're going to do is we're going to go through handout um, 15. Now, the te text here on this slide is really very, very small, because as you can see, what I preferred to put in was all the lovely pictures um, on things that might be quite pleasant to do. So when we're looking at um, slide number uh, to handout number 15, what we're starting with is do something from the pleasant events list. OK, so what I want you to do is pause again and out of the ones that you have ticked, I want you to write down over the next seven days. Three from those pleasant events um, list that you could do each day and they do need to be different. So you're going to have a bit of an experiment here. They only need to be small. So one might be, you know, just um, having a look at a single flower in a vase. Another one might be taking extra care, making yourself that cup of tea. Maybe you're going to make it out with um, a pot of tea rather than, than just stick a tea bag in a mug. So small things that can make a difference throughout your day. So again, so you're going to pause, 
So you're going to write down the next seven days and you're going to put three by each day that you're going to experiment with. And as part of the homework, you're going to be completing worksheet 10, which is the Pleasance Events Diary, which is designed for daily use. So this is how you're going to monitor and look at what are the results from these experiments from the Pleasant Events list. And we're going to have a very brief look at how you do that. First of all, you know, you, 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 pick, you pick what you're going to be doing each day. And then here's the crucial bit, because the urge is likely to be, oh, I'll do that tomorrow, or um, maybe um, I can't be bothered today. So whatever it is that's helping you to avoid doing that, you're going to practice opposite action. And when you're doing your present events list, what you're going to be doing is being very mindful of the task at hand. So it's like a mindful activity. And this is really important because by paying attention to positive experiences in a mindful way, we get ourselves in the zone of um, what we're doing. And the more positive experiences we can have when we're in the zone of doing things, the happier we are. So this is sounds like the gift that keeps on giving. OK, so then what you're doing, because this is a mind, this is a mindful exercise. You're going to be drawing on the skills that you have before of moving your attention back when your mind wanders onto something negative. And think of things in advance uh, that might get in the way. So you do you have one of those thoughts of I'm not deserving of, of, of pleasant events, th of pleasant things to do? Do you have judgments there? Think of that what's going to get in the way and then just allow yourself to just notice that you're having that thought and bring yourself back to the task because that's what we do in mindfulness, isn't it? Don't anticipate worries. So don't be worrying about, or oh, when is this going to end? Um, or will more be expected of me? You, the idea is to stay in the moment with the task that you're focusing on, on in that time. And the idea of the Pleasant Events Diary is that you can assess this. So there might be things that you try that actually think, do you know what, that was that was a nice thing to try, but you know, I don't, I don't think that's for me. I'm gonna try some others because they may work better for me. And you're not going to know unless you unless you give it a go. So what we're going to look at now is how do we accumulate positive emotions in the longer term? So in order to do this, we're working with the values and the priorities that we have in our lives that make our lives feel like they're worth living. And this is hugely important. Um, it's impossible to just go with coping all the time. We need to have things that help us build lives that feel like they feel good for us. They're worth us staying in. In order to do that, the things that we um, want to push ourselves towards need to fit in with our values and our priorities in life. So with that, and because I said I did say this is quite an interactive session, isn't it? I want you to pause the video again. OK, because you're going to get um, the handout 18 and you're going to go through the handout 18, completing the values and priorities list. So it gives you a better idea of the sort of things that you want to work towards. So I'm assuming you've done press play again and we're now continuing with the video and I just want you to look over the, the values and priorities that you've listed and just ask yourselves a few questions. Are these values really my own? Sometimes when we're growing up, other people's values get placed upon us in a way that's not helpful. Sometimes we feel that we should be aiming for something that actually doesn't fit with us very well at all. A good way of um, assessing whether that is right or not is just to think about, OK, if I could act according to this particular value, but not tell anyone about it, would I still do it? So, for example, if being educated was something that was an important value for me, 
I might feel therefore that my goal has got to be completing a specific course. So let's think, I don't know, I might feel that actually the, that I want to aim for the highest qualification um, that you could, which would be a PhD. If I then imagine doing that without telling anybody that I'm doing it and without telling anybody that I've achieved it, would it still have the same meaning for me? Likewise, if you're thinking, you know, I want to get a job caring for other people. Just pause a moment and ask yourself, you know, is this something that I feel is part of me? Or is this something that's been placed upon me? If I was doing this job caring for other people and I didn't tell anybody about it, is it still something that feels like it would be important for me? Are there other jaws that I want to have a little explore through? feel like they might fit for me a bit better. So then what we're going to do is we're going to um, avoid avoiding. Identify the values that are important to you, which is what you've done on that list. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go back through that list and I want you to choose your top three currently because this will change as well, but choose your top three currently. You might want to pause the video again. And then what I want you to do is I want you to identify one of those three that you're going to work on now. Now this means breaking it down you're going to break it down into stages because in order to achieve a goal, you have got to break it down into smaller steps if we're looking at this longer term. We also need to look at whether the goals are reasonable. There's no point in setting up goals that can't be achieved. So, for example, um, if I decided now that, that, that what I wanted to do was to... Um, be a famous dancer at Sadler's Wells Ballet and um, be on stage at the Opera House. I, it, it's possible that I might achieve that in some sort of quirky way. However, realistically, it's unlikely that that is achievable. My age would go against me. My level of fitness would go against me. And um, actually, you have to work really quite hard and be very talented to get on. Um, uh, to be a professional ballerina. I think I'm possibly past that point now. However, I might want to redefine that goal. I might need to say, well, actually, that's not going to happen. But actually, I really like the idea of doing some dancing. Maybe my goal is to find a dance group that I want to belong to. Now, that is achievable. And then what I'd need to do is have a look at the steps that would be involved in that. Also have a look at if your goal involves a lot of self-sacrifice for other people. So, for example, if you decide that actually giving away your life savings to a friend who wants a new car um, would allow you to be generous and caring, which is what you want to do. You also need to think that actually that might also cause you long term harm because you're not going to have any money at all. It doesn't help your friends sort out their own practical issues. And the only temporary gain is your friend's transport needs. So just have a look at the goals that you've written down, whether they are reasonable, whether they are achievable, and whether they um, involve any level of self-sacrifice on your part that possibly isn't helpful in the longer term. Choose one goal to work on now. What one thing in the moment from distress tolerance is a really useful um, way of approaching this. And then when you've got your goal, then you're identifying small action steps towards your goal. Take one now, not tomorrow. Now. Obviously, when you finish watching the video. Now B is for build mastery. 
This is hugely important because self-esteem just doesn't just happen. We don't just get a bit of self-esteem. Um, we certainly don't just do a module in how to build self-esteem and it just appears. Self-esteem is intricately connected with, um, intrinsically is what I meant to say, connected with what we actually do in life and how pleased we are with what we're able to um, achieve. <clears throat> so how we feel about ourselves is derived from our own actions. And this can be something that's quite small. It can be something we feel we've accomplished or it can be something that we're working towards that's much bigger. Now, I don't know if any of you have watched um, Kung Fu Panda. I absolutely love Kung Fu Panda. And um, there are some, it is absolutely full to overflowing with lots of very, very wise sayings about what can help us in life. And um, I love this quote of, if you only do what you can do, you will never be better than what you are. And I think it's really true for our lives, isn't it? What we strive and want to achieve. We want a life worth living. And in order to get a life worth living, we have to do some things that allow us to see ourselves in different ways and find new skills that we have that we can be, be pleased with. <clears throat> we also need to look at um, how we motivate ourselves to do that. So if you watch Kung Fu Fat Panda, what his motivation was, was food, something that is obviously very dear to my heart. So building in rewards for ourselves, building in little pit stops where we can stop and reflect on some of the things that um, we feel we've achieved is really important. So if you allow yourself to pause right now, thinking of thing, think of things that you've accomplished whilst you've been on the course. Maybe there's been times when you've come to a session when you didn't want to, or maybe you came to a session when you were afraid to. Maybe you learned a skill and found that it works. Keep a list of those things that you've accomplished. Because trust me, in, in another few months, you're going to sit there and go, well, I know I have done some things, but I can't remember all that they want because they have become unconscious. They have become things that you just do automatically. And when we do things automatically, we don't then pay attention to them. So with building mastery, what we need to do is we need to follow some of the ideas around in um, accumulating positive experiences in the longer term. And when we're doing that, we need to have a look at um, small steps again. OK, so I just want I don't know if you're going to be able to see this slide on your phone. But basically, this is um, a poster about getting fit for the peaks, to have a mountaineering expedition on the horizon. OK, now I can honestly say hand on heart, there is no way I'd be doing that. Um, however, some of you might feel quite excited about things like that. But either, either way, it doesn't really matter. What I want to point out is what somebody has to do to prepare to build mastery when they are mountaineering. So for the first thing they need to do is they need to have a training schedule. They need to begin training 12 to six weeks before they go. They need to aim for about 45 to 90 minutes of cardio three or four times a week, jogging, cycling, swimming, um, stair climbing. They need to do interval training. Um, they need to do strength training a couple of days a week. So what you can see is, is there's small steps that they build up to something. And that's also what we do when we're building mastery over something. And we start small. So there's um, that Couch to 5K um, app would be a really good one as a first step towards getting fit for doing mountaineering. It builds up your stamina, builds up your strength, but it does it really small. Um, so you do a half an hour a half an hour um, walk, but they were in that walk there would only be like a few one minute runs to start off with. Starting really small, and when you've done that and you feel good that you've been able to accomplish that, probably quite breathlessly at, the, at first, then you can move on to the next step. And the whole idea of the Couch to 5K is that it happens in small stages. And this is where it's really important for building mastery. You're going to plan on doing at least one thing each day to build a sense of accomplishment. 
So you're working here from handout 19. By doing this, what you're then going to do is you're going to have a more positive self-concept, a higher self-esteem, overall greater level of, ha of happiness. What you're doing is you're planning for success, not failure. So you're doing something that's slightly difficult, but not impossible. Um, so in the same way, so if you decide you want to get more into DIY, start with putting a shelf up, not with building an entire wardrobe from scratch. Equally, if you think you'd quite like to get into baking, you know, starting with some biscuits or some cupcakes could be a really good start. Really good idea not to go with a fruit cake or bread to start with. Those are far more difficult to do. And if you're going to go with making some biscuits or some cupcakes, look upon it as an experiment. Go, OK, so I'm going to see how this goes because I might do this recipe and I might want to tweak it a bit. Or I might do this recipe and find that actually I've missed out some key ingredients. So there's another top tip. Make life easier for yourself. Is that If there is instructions for doing something, follow them. If there's a YouTube video on how to do it, look at it before you do it. Things build up in small steps. So for instance, if somebody decides, actually, do you know, I've always wanted to know what my, my times tables. Nobody sits there in a day and learns their times table. However, if you get all the times tables and you put each one on a little card and you go through those cards every single day, I can assure you within a few weeks, you're going to know the majority of your times table and you're probably going to feel really good about yourself. So you're in this for the long haul because in the longer term, that's when you build up that sense of mastery. That's when you build up the sense of accomplishment then you gradually increase the difficulty over a period of time. And here's another one. If it's a bit too easy, make it a bit more difficult next time. So you're pushing yourself, you're stretching yourself. You're finding out what you can actually do. So for instance, if you start with biscuits and cupcakes and they're really quite easy and you fancy, well, do you know what? I'm gonna go for a fruit cake. Go for it. Look for the challenge. So I suppose what I want you to leave you with is, is a really good saying which says success breeds motivation. I also want you to leave with the fact that, that we have um, many, many doors that we could open and have a little look behind in our lives. And what we tend to do, we tend to just go for the same door over and over and over again because it's safe, it's comfortable, we know it. But actually all these doors there could be some really exciting things behind those doors. There could be things that we try we just never even knew we could do. So you try a new door today. So C is cope ahead. Cope ahead of time with emotional situations. And this is one of my all time favorite skills. And I know I have a lot of them. This is one of my all time favorite skills. And this is one that I pretty much swear by all the time. I do a lot of planning ahead. And this is really important because um, if we can anticipate some of the situations in life that might possibly cause us a few problems or conflicts, then we are going to be better able to deal with them if we do a bit of contingency planning. The other advantage with this is that um, we can imagine ourselves in, in ahead of time coping with that situation. And what is quite magical about this is there has been a lot of studies that have shown that if we can um, rehearse in our imagination something that we're going to do, whether that's a skill or whether that's a conversation or whether that's an action, our brains interpret it the same way as if we've actually done it. So this is like a win-win because we can imagine doing this in our heads and our brains will adapt to it as if it is real. So we feel like we've already been there. We feel like we've got more skills in order to cope with these situations. You may have seen um, some clips of people doing um, particular like gymnastic um, moves where they have rehearsed them in their head before. 
and then they go on to um, do them in real life. And studies have shown that those people who rehearsed those in their head before were more successful in, with those new um, gymnastic movements when they were actually in action. So this is hugely powerful. Our minds are massively powerful and we can use them here to our advantage. If we're able to cope ahead of time with things that could potentially cause high emotional um, um, pain, then we're gonna be much more able to deal with them. Equally, if there are things that are happening in our lives, patterns in happening in our lives interpersonally, if we can spend some time thinking about those, break them down in stages and look at how we might want to manage them differently, that really helps as well. So here you're working again from handout 19. And I'm going to give you um, a few examples. So I'm going to, one of the ones I'm going to quote with is from um, Marsha Lynham. So she says that she suddenly became driving, afraid of driving in tunnels. To reduce this fear, she started driving in every tunnel she could find, opposite action, reassuring herself that there was no danger of its falling in on me. When this didn't work, because actually the, if you're doing fit in the facts, a tunnel could fall in on her, um, particularly since earthquakes are quite common where she lived, she asked herself, um, what's the threat? She then realized that telling herself that the tunnel wouldn't fall in was avoiding the threat. So next she drove through tunnels and imagined that one did fall on her. She then imagined jumping out the car, putting on her Wonder Woman outfit and rushing to save others. And here's a top tip as well. If when you're doing imagined rehearsal, you can bring anything you like into that clip and your mind will accommodate it. Now you might say, well, that's, that's not gonna happen in real life. It doesn't matter, your brain likes it. If your brain likes it, you're gonna feel calmer. So she noticed that the fear came down a lot from 80 to 30, um, but it did not come down to zero. So she asked herself again, what's the threat? And realized that her primary fear was the that the tunnel would not only cave in, but she would be trapped with extreme pain. It's not sounding great, is it? And nobody could get to her to save her. So what she then did was she imagined, imagined practicing radical acceptance of pain and death. And after several practices, that fear went away completely. So it's a really interesting one about how our brain processes these things. And I, it made me um, remember an incident that I um, was really afraid of doing when I was um, visiting somebody in London. I had to, I know I knew I had to get the, um, the underground in rush hour. And this is not a pleasant experience. It's very, very crowded. And I'm not great at being in very confined spaces with lots and lots of people crushed up against me. Um, so what I did was I did an imaginary rehearsal. But before I did that, I did several key things that I want you to think about here and sort of fits into the idea that, you know, if you want to learn mastery over something or if you, if you um, want to cope over time, doing your research is a really good idea. Ask people. People often have knowledge that we don't have. So what I did was I spoke to people who regularly use the tube. Um, so I asked them, um, where do you normally stand at this particular tube station to make it less likely that I'm going to have to fight to get on the train and that less likely that I'm going to be in the most crowded part of the train? And then I spoke to people and asked them, so where, where, where could you um, stand where, in the tube train where you're going to feel um, least claustrophobic? So um, basically top tip, sitting down on one of those little seats in the middle, not a good idea because people tower over you. So I have got this information. So I thought, right, I'm going to rehearse this in my mind. So I rehearsed in my mind, standing on that particular area of the um, tube station. I imagined getting myself into the tube train calmly. I imagined myself moving myself towards um, the area that I want to stand by the by the window that's um, between the partitions of the two trains. And I imagined all the obstacles that I might come across. And this is hugely important because we can do this. We can imagine all these obstacles in, in the peacefulness of our own homes and deal with them calmly so that we're more prepared for them when they come up. 
So I imagine lots of things happening. I imagine that um, lots of people would come in and try to um, crush up against me as, as and what I would do then. I imagined um, the, the train crashing and what I would do then. And I worked very much with what I, what can I do something about and like Marshall Line and what, what would I have to radically accept. And by replaying that over and over in my mind, my fear of that, the incident reduced and I was able then to get on that tube train and go and get to my destination. This also works with, um, with interpersonal issues. So you, like this slide, the little picture of a book which says guilt trip just ahead. There are usually patterns of behaviours that we fall into with people we're in relationship to. They usually um, follow not only a pattern, but also an outcome. And maybe that happens to you. So, you know, is there a pattern that you tend to get into when you're talking with somebody close to you? How does it start? Just drop that down. What then what happens? And then do the and then question as many times as you need to. And then look at how does it normally end? How do you end up feeling? So then the beauty of planning ahead is where can you intervene in a different way that would give you a different ending? Then rehearse that in your mind. Rehearse what that would be like to say something in a different way. Rehearse what the other person might say and how you might respond to that. And for those of you who are about to do the interpersonal skills modules, like this is, there's some really top, good top tips there. And for those of you who've already done it, draw on your interpersonal skills. Rehearse in your mind how you're going to manage that situation. So what's really important to convey about coping ahead is it works. There is a reason why they have flight simulators. There is a reason why they train astronauts to go up into space. Rehearsal works. And on the handout, you'll see there are several key stages to that. Describing the situation is really important. And you remember that the last session we did a, a describing mindfulness exercise. Look at the facts, what it is that you're describing. Decide what coping or problem solving skills you want to use in that situation. So look back over your handouts, look at what's worked, look at perhaps skills you haven't used very, very often. Would they fit this situation? And then imagine the situation in your mind as vividly as possible. Now, as soon as I say vividly, people normally say, well, I can't I can't imagine something or I can't I, I don't see things in colours. It doesn't really matter. What you're just doing is you're just rehearsing something in your head. And however your brain does that, that's absolutely fine. That's how it does it. Then rehearse it with your coping strategies in place, coping effectively. Notice what comes up. Notice the obstacles. If there are obstacles, go back, rehearse it again with something additional. After you've done all this, practice relaxation after rehearsing. What that's really doing is it's teaching your brain that everything's OK. So sending messages to our brain saying it's all right, you can you can relax is really important. What that does is it allows that experience to be embedded in your brain. It allows your brain to process that experience. OK, so happy planning ahead of time. Homework practice tasks. I think these are really good fun tasks to do this week. Um, all that you're going to be focusing on is how can I improve my life? And that just sounds like nobody could argue with that being a good thing. It's really good for us. And you're going to be doing this on a daily basis. So worksheets 10 and 11B offer daily use. Those are where you accumulate those positive events. That's where you build that mastery. So your homework is to utilise handouts 14 to 20. 
and to complete the worksheets 9 to 14. You'll be doing 10 and 11b anyway um, for daily use. And happy experimenting. I can't wait to see what you discover from this. So, skills training wind down. How great is that clip? I couldn't resist it. Well done you. You've done five sessions of emotion regulation and how much have you learned so far? These skills will last you all your life. You can revisit these at any time. How amazing is that? So I want you to just allow yourself to think about what you've learned and think about what are you taking away from with you from this session? I realise I'm, I'm slightly covering up this, this other clip. She's such a happy little chap, isn't she? Um, what makes you smile? Add that to your list, things that make you smile. This is a great list that you can look back to, back at when you need to. And I will see you in the next video for Emotion Regulation 6.